when it was instrumental in setting up um, Social Investment Scotland and a lot of other um, social investment entities. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to, to have you here. Um, so you have many former roles, including Chief Executive of Lloyd's TSB uh, Bank in, in Scotland and um, obviously various other um, non-exec roles. Um, I, I wonder if you could just start off, please, um, just to tell us a little bit about um, yourself and your, your career. Um, and then we'll get on to speaking about Social Investment Scotland. I'd be happy to do that, Kieran, and thank you very much for having me. So, um, career is uh, not something, not a term I've often applied to myself, but I've had a lot of interesting jobs and a lot of interesting things to do. Um, my husband's from Scotland. We lived in America for a long time. That's where I'm from. I worked there. I worked in higher education administration for a while, and then I went into banking. So that's for another another um, story, not just now. Um, and in banking in the US, because of some things that were happening there, I ran a, a big division in sort of mainstream banking, but I was asked to um, get involved with the regulators there uh, in relation to a law that had to do with banks um, redlining or avoiding doing business in certain minority and disadvantaged communities. And out of that work, I gained a big interest in those organizations that were working in these communities and trying to get funding out and trying to support uh, what was going on. And, um, and so when we moved to, back to Scotland, I had sort of two arms to my career. One was just like, you know, I'm a banker, um, but the other was this strong interest in a number of organizations on which I'd sat on the board or helped form over in and around the New York area. Mm. that provided um, social, what we call social investment or social finance in this country. It was called something different over there. So that was the, the, the background. Came here, found myself working um, originally at what was the Bank of Scotland before it was bought by sure. Halifax and became <laughs> HBO. So this goes way back. Um, and found somehow that in the UK, the stars were lined up in a way. And when I say that, you, you you need people, you need finance, and you need a will and a motivation to do some new things in the market. Um, and it, this is the, you know, early, so it's 18, 19 years ago, you know, the early 2000s. And I found we had a new, newish government in the UK with that interest. We had recent devolution in Scotland mm. and a government here that was really interested in communities and in helping organizations stand on their own two feet. And helping people move on in life um, came across somebody who's um, like me a patron of social investment scotland wendy alexander yes. yep. um, and she said oh the government had an idea about um, uh, uh, creating an entity that could uh, invest in um, in charities that provided this kind of community support and uh, I became involved in that project um, and uh, was the only financial person around the table. Others were from the charity sector and from government and from wherever. And eventually we got there. Um, and, uh, and it was rather curious because um, the, the model we had to fund Social Investment Scotland to begin with was to have the, what were then the four banks in Scotland each put some money in, invest in, so that there'd be a pool of money that Social Investment Scotland could then use to invest in charities. And um, when we got to that point, I had moved from the job I had to becoming Chief Executive of Lloyd's TSB Scotland. So I had to get um, the other three banks, I had to get my own bank to say yes. It wasn't my job as chief executive to do that, but my colleagues were very kind and said, yes, that's fine. Um, and this had to be treated as an investment off our balance sheet. Mm. And then I called uh, chief executive, I knew them all, of the next bank. And I said, by the way, want the four banks, explain the initiative, want the four banks to invest. I've already spoken to one chief executive and they've signed on. There was silence at the other end when they were thinking, which one is that? And then I filled the silence and said, it's me. Um, <laughs> and then that yeah. person said, fine, I'll do it. And that's how Social Investment Scotland came about. So um, there's lots more to the career, but that's a bit of the mm. how it took me there. It's really interesting um, that the way it was formed. And we were speaking the other day about Social Investment Scotland and it was really breaking new ground at the time as a leader in terms of um, I guess investment in the UK 
And um, I'm just I'm wondering your experience of um, being in America and then coming to um, the UK to set up Social Investment Scotland. Was it um, it was breaking new ground? It was a new territory. It pro was it seen as being a risky thing to do for for banks or? Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so as, as yeah. with in my experience professionally, um, yeah. when you're going to use uh, some of your financial resources as yeah. a bank or any other kind of business, you need to find a, a narrative to make it work for the institution. Sure. Um, and yeah. so sometimes the narrative is that government comes to you and says, we have some goals for, for the country, for society, we'd like you to help, and institutions will say yes. Other times they have other things in their mind, but this really was quite new. There were some other entities also being considered, different types of financial mm. entities, but all in the social or impact finance space, developing at the same time. And they all kind of focused in a different space, uh, rather complementary to each other. Um, but with Social Investment Scotland, it seemed really important to be able to get investment out to charities that were doing a good job, that were well managed, but if you could invest in them, they could do more of that, they could grow, mm -hmm. they could become more self-sufficient if they, if they had that kind of strength. And, and that seems so important to do. So when I said it's about uh, the stars lining up, it's about people like myself or Wendy and many others mm -hmm. or some others who have an interest. It's about accessing finances in a way that the organization is willing to release the finances, if you see what I mean. And, um, and then it's about uh, really the people. You've got at the, bo the bottom of it, you need the people who say, we will make this work. Here's the vision. Let's go for it. And that's what we had with Social Investment Scotland. The stars aligned altogether. I just want to check with um, your microphone. I, I don't know if there's any paper which is um, over or it might be my end. That, I think that's cleared. Uh, that's all perfect. I could hear you perfectly though, it was just a little shuffle. Oh, sorry, okay. Nope. That's tiny my little desk, shuffle. My desk is covered with paper because it's where I work now. So. <laughs> tiny, <laughs> not at all, not at all. I mean, it's fascinating to hear about um, uh, Social Investment Scotland starting up. And of course, you mentioned um, some other um, entities. So yeah. there was Charity Bank, Big Society Capital, and um, a range of, range of others at the time. Um, I wonder if you can just um, um, say something about the range of different entities and the role they played within the ecosystem. What was the rationale for, I guess, Charity Bank, Big Society Capital? They, they all have different functions, but they all work quite closely, obviously, within an ecosystem. Yeah, so in a way, I think they all started with some people again, you know, somebody yeah. who had yeah. an idea. So um, I was, uh, for two years, I think, part of a, a lot of conversations with a small group of people who were very interested in setting up Charity Bank. Charity Bank is a savings and loan. It's a bank. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the only one where its customer base is entirely charities. Um, and its yeah. perspective was charities exist. Um, and often they have assets, but they don't know how to put those assets to use for themselves to become bigger and stronger yeah. and do a better job. Yeah. This was something I had worked in in that space over in America in a couple of the entities where I sat on boards and it, it resonated with me, made a lot of sense. So after a couple of years, we were able to get set up and have a banking license, had to be approved by the charity commissioner. So it's a very odd structure. All of these are slightly odd structures. You have to be a bit some um, entrepreneurial and imaginative uh, sure. for some of these entities yeah. but what um what charity bank can do is make loans to um let's say there's a charity that owns a building um well, that's fine it owns a building it carries out its work in that building but mm -hmm. if it can take um an affordable loan mm -hmm. against that property which uh, another kind of business might do then it can perhaps expand uh, get another property, expand what it's doing, move to another place in town, whatever it needs to do. So that is the idea. Charity Bank was also uh, a way of having individual investors who wanted to put money into mm. um, social improvement, but didn't know how to get the money to the right places. Sure. So investors yeah, yeah. could um, save with Charity Bank, um, it was a savings and loan, and mm. that gave Charity Bank, the, and still does, the money to lend out. So mm -hmm. that was that model very different from Social Investment Scotland, mm. um, but you know, works in a different way, but alongside it in terms of mission. Mm. Um, Big Society Capital, again, the uh, inspiration from one individual, Sir Ronnie Cohen, um, 
and and the idea there was that there were a number of uh, what I would call in the U.S. third-party financial intermediaries, it's a terrible term, but <laughs> yeah. intermediaries and Social Investment Scotland is one of those. Mm -hmm. So what you do is obtain funding from wherever, and you now have lots of sources of funding, yes, um, yeah. and you get it out to the right places and you evaluate um, those who need and want some funding, you help them. You sometimes, if they're not ready, you will help them get ready for that. Um, you know, you, you're the entity that becomes an expert in your geography in um, getting that, those funds out. And um, big society capital then felt, well, there aren't too many of these intermediaries. Um, so if some of them are doing a good job, maybe we can help them expand faster. Mm -hmm. um, so its job is, is as a wholesale investor, wholesaling uh, investments into intermediaries, which then go on to reach out to the uh, charities in the community. And of course, as we both know, um, Social Investment Scotland has um, been highly regarded um, within big society capital and has received some of that investment and you've grown on the back of that. Absolutely, absolutely. we're very proud of that um, and the journey um, that yeah. we, we've come on. I, I'm wondering at the time when, when um, we were setting up Social Investment Scotland, um, the landscape, the charity landscape and the social enterprise landscape um, isn't as developed perhaps as it was now. And perhaps, you know, the uptake for risk within the sector at that time um, is hopefully um, different to now, but there must have been a lot of hearts and minds types of conversations and, and thinking about um, making progress in this brave new world of, of so social investment. I wonder if you can say a few things about uh, just the, the situation at the time. Yes, so um, I would say that in most larger organisations and certainly most established banks, um, there there's a term CSR, which is a term I've never subscribed to, corporate social responsibility. Um, it, it, you know, being socially responsible should be part of your business. You, you shouldn't have to have a team, you know, specifically mm. over there that does it. Um, but but so so it, it's not as if it was a foreign. But that was. If you think about it, that's about an organization saying we want to be responsible in how we use our funds. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's different from saying we want to see society benefit back because the charities that can help people, for instance, um, you know, find their way into work or, you know, whatever it is, that all helps. There's a, a virtuous circle in, in all of this that um, I think wasn't really you know, perceived then. So mm. some organization had some money, it might put it out for a purpose and might put that in its annual report. But when you get into uh, real social enterprises and then the uh, funders of those enterprises, the, this is about um, taking or combining a commercial approach and a, and a social approach or a charitable approach together. Uh, and so you fund um, a charity that, uh, and a, it's kind of a commercial basis. It would be different commercials from a bank, perhaps, um, mm -hmm. that lets it continue to do what it's doing and um, and it has to behave responsibly in terms of that funding. It isn't just about grants. If you think about it, uh, grants would typically have been given out. Um, mm -hmm. A grant is a one-time thing. Um, maybe a charity is lucky and gets it for three years, but um, they might have it once. And if times are tough, as you know, we know right now, yeah. economically, a lot yeah. of those grants would dry up and then what happens? There isn't that sustainability for those really good, um, successful charitable organizations. And so this notion of bringing a commercial uh, approach to funding those organizations on top of any grants that they might receive um, was a way to help sustain them over time, give them a long-term future and mean that they would be more successful. And, and you, you spoke about the role, I guess, of, of banks and um, the role of investment. So from, from social investment to, I guess, mainstream investment, we're seeing more um, environmental, social and governance practices um, within the, the banking sector. And I wonder if you can say about the role of um, ESG investments in making mainstream corporations um, more kind of um, held to account so, and also what you've seen as a growing impact and a growing trend in, in that space? 
Yes, so there certainly is some change. There's been a lot of talk for a number of years, but I'd say in the last few years, there's some genuine change happening. If you're a bank, um, you might have very good motives and you might be well funded and you might you know use your money well and appropriately um but you're you're accountable not just to your customers you're a, a, a range of stakeholders including those who invest in you um what's happened recently is that the investment community has become really focused in this area and uh and esg of course is environment social and governance so sort of three aspects of responsible business uh, and um, the investment community is now um, and has been for a few years talking about these areas, um, saying how it's important they are, um, talking to those in whom they invest about the importance and much more recently metrics are being developed so that mm. they can be shared um, so that um, investment funds should be showing not just how they are doing financially, but how they're doing against their ESG metrics. That is, you know, should be as important as what they're doing financially. And the reason that should be as important is that that takes you into the longer term. So in a business that looks at itself in terms of financial performance, typically for a long time, they've looked at the last quarter or the last half year and they've done well or not. It's a very short term view. They plan for longer, but the performance uh, analysis around finances is very short term. The ESG is much longer term. It reminds the business that it has customers or it has impacts in society, mm -hmm. that it may not be around if it destroys um, its reputation or if it destroys those aspects of society. So um, the ESG metrics and that focus, hugely important, and it's getting much more airtime, if you will now. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because um, it's getting much more airtime and obviously we've, so at Social Investment Scotland, we've developed new models and, um, or we're, we've developed develop new products so that we can invest in mission um, driven businesses and different businesses where um, the mission is locked into the articles um, and it's becoming more sustainable. But COVID-19, it's going to have a, an impact. It is having an impact on the economy and I wonder what, you know, your view is as someone who has worked obviously within investment for, for quite a while, um, what are the opportunities, I guess, for people who would have um, invested in many different areas? So thinking about social models through social investment tax relief, through enterprise um, investment tax relief, um, thinking about people that want to invest um, their money to do good. Um, what do you think might be the, the impacts of I guess, a time like um, COVID-19 and, and, and to more society? You know, that's a really, really good and a really important. So when I started off talking about uh, the 2000s, I said everything was aligned. Um, it's because times were pretty good economically and there were a lot of people and there were businesses that had money, they had cash and they wanted to invest it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they could take a bit of a risk with some of it, risk capital, if you will, yes. um, and put it here or there and they could still get on with their um, day job, as it were. Uh, and, and so that that was a good situation. We're now looking at what uh, absolutely everybody um, says is, you know, will be a recession. This is a global impact. This is quite extraordinary what um, has and is happening around COVID-19. Um, so a couple of comments there. Um, in my experience, and I sit on or chair a number of boards um, in different sectors, so in utilities, in, in retail, um, investment uh, trust, and, and, um, and I talk to a lot of people in other sectors as well, um, everyone has done just as much as they were able to over the last couple of months just to keep their, their businesses alive and going and making sure about the safety of their their employees, their colleagues, uh, which of course is part of ESG, which is looking after uh, your own people. That's really, really important. Um, the government, both the UK and of course in Scotland in its own way as well, uh, have come out with um, packages to, to help as many businesses as possible survive this and as many people as possible retain jobs. I mean, these are these are core fundamental needs. Mm -hmm. um, it may be quite a while till we actually think 
this whole experience is behind us, but mm -hmm. there is a future, there's always going to be a future. Um, and, and so uh, what I'm finding from organizations that I interact with is that conversations, particularly around net zero, because a number, mm -hmm. you know, in the winter, December, January, even early February, a number of particularly in Scotland, um, with its announcements about net zero at the beginning of the year, a number were really focused on that, uh, that space. Um, and, uh, and, and so that hasn't gone away, um, but it is up to responsible businesses to make sure that those elements are still in their, um, you know, in their strategy and in their, in their purview. Um, if a business is going to operate, um, if, Again, if you think of CSR as being an added extra as it used to be, and you put a little money sure. in it, well, maybe yeah. if times are tough, you don't have the money. But if you say that's how we run our business, mm -hmm. you simply create a strategy and decide how you spend your financial resources in ways that are consistent with some of those ESG uh, goals at the same time as you're getting your business back uh, in shape. So there's something about the mindset about not seeing these things as separate, mm -hmm. but it's um, business is absolutely understanding. This is, this is, you know, how we have to think as we get our businesses back um, on their feet. And certainly there's a lot of talk just now. I don't know how long it will last, but I hope it does, yeah. um, which yeah. is that, so it, there's been a huge um, focus on, on the E on the environmental. Uh, everybody's been fo focused on that. We've had, COP26, which was due to come here in Scotland, yes. very exciting, November yeah, yeah. this year that's now been postponed by a year, um, which is too bad on the one hand, but it gives us a year to do more in preparation for that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But a lot of people have said with the current crisis that there's perhaps more of a focus on the social. Um, there's a real sense of, um, of, of people, of uh, the sort of very sad stories and the sad um you know outcomes from from this uh pandemic but also the way people have supported each other um uh, the way food banks have operated mm. um yeah. the way people have learned to care uh, often in in a more local way and in their communities than they might have done before they'd go out the door and go to work and that would be that um so uh so i think that these esg um, uh, the CSG focus um, may may change in the S um, and you know the G has always been there that's maybe the first that got a lot of attention mm. then it was the mm. E um, they won't go away but the the S will come very much more to the fore and I suspect Social Investment Scotland in terms of supporting mm. some of the charities you support are looking at those that support people um, uh, mental health has, has risen to you know the front of everybody's agenda in terms of the strains for some people who are working from home or who may fear losing jobs and, and whatever. So the the or the entities, the organizations that support people in mm. society with those kinds of needs um, need a whole lot of uh, support just now. And if you think about it as a kind of circular. Uh, on me, businesses mm -hmm. as they get on their feet want their staff to be functioning and, and well and able um, to come in or to work in some new ways if that's what they decide to do. Mm. Uh, and so it's important to provide those kinds of supports to people now. Um, so uh, I think it, another difference is that this has really focused us all um, much more on our own um, geographies, I think. Uh, you know, yeah. it's become a, a national thing. It's a completely global pandemic. But it is focused some of the activities and the and the kind of caring side of it um, much more locally. And the reason for that is because it's about people, and that this is where we are. So, um, you know, again, an entity like Social Investment Scotland um, mm. that has a geography that it serves and where it is known, where it knows um its potential customers well really really important at this point in time so i don't think i actually mm. answered your question but you got me going on on that yeah no, it's, <laughs> it's a good well it's a good train of thought and um it kind of leads me into another question uh, thinking about the time that we're in just now on communities coming together we have seen some brilliant brilliant um brilliant initiatives and um, what and thinking about the future of social enterprise and the role of um, social investment itself. Now I guess social investment since 20 years ago 
it's um, going, we've gone through a recession, come out of a recession, and there's been peaks and troughs, and that's affected the grants made available to charities and to, to social enterprises. We're, we're going, going through a time now where we're going to go through another recession and we'll come out again. Um, there's always a kind of tension between grant giving and as you said there will be less money about and the trajectory is probably that um, there will continue to be less um, grant money available and would you say would you say that's going to shape and impact the future of social enterprise and do you think that um, social enterprise or models for trading and social investment do you think they'd be ever more needed so i think that Social enterprise is part of enterprise. Um, it's it's part of you know a social enterprise is uh, a business, whether it's um, structured as a charity or not as a charity. But it's it's a business. It's an organization, um, and some organizations, uh, you know, there's a continuum. Um, so so yeah. some organizations, and a big bank uh, deals with the vast majority of its customers um, in certain ways. Uh, it's always harder to for any organization, not just a bank, but for any to look at the needs of customers at either end of that continuum. Um, so social enterprise is another kind of enterprise which um, changes the balance, if you think of an old fashioned scale, mm. um, with you know, the commercial and the social good and the social impact and measures itself and, and often in its, um, in its mission statement so that it starts out that way in terms of the social impact that it has. Uh, at the end of the day, most businesses that I know take their custom from communities, from people, from businesses, uh, and those need to be healthy. They, you know, they have to function mm. in order for you to have um, the, the custom that you want. It's, it's not just about playing war games in a, in a closed room. It's actually about customers out there and needs out there, communities and society. And so I think that there is a place for social enterprise now and there will continue to be. Um, you know, what may change is how they're financed. Um, th things may change because that's what happens at times of, of stress, such as the one that we're in now. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they will disappear because I don't think they're an add-on. I think they have increasingly become more of a mainstream, um, wide choice, uh, wide continuum of ways to uh, support the economy and to support people. I, and um, we, I, we definitely, obviously, subscribe to, to that view. And uh, there are a range of different um, legal structures and, and organisations set up um, which deliver social purpose. You're the chair of Scottish Water, and obviously that's quite an interesting organisation because it's a public um, body and it's, it's an interesting structure. It has a commitment to net zero and to other um, other social and uh, governance impacts. I wonder if you can say a little bit about, um, as being chair of that organisation, how you ha drive that commitment to net zero and other factors um, through the core of that business? Yes, so, um, so Scottish Water is a very interesting organisation. It, um, it's, a, it's a publicly owned corporation, um, so that in itself is unusual. Yeah. I chair the board. We operate to um, sort of codes of, of uh, expectation and conduct that you'd see in the private sector, but our shareholder, our owner, if you will, is the people of Scotland, is the mm. Scottish Parliament. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's a, you know, an, I would say this, but I really do, do mean it. It's an extraordinary organization in terms of... Um, what it uh, you know what it does and how it operates. It also provides water that's an essential service. I mean, life depends on water yes. at the best of times, and um, yeah. so you know at the worst of times, such as now, um, uh, the first thing Scottish Water had to do was stand up its contingency arrangements immediately um, mm. in order to understand how to make sure that we kept the water flowing, the sewers working, um, the floods at bay, in other words, to keep doing our business because. That is absolutely at its core. Um, at the same time, it is uh, publicly owned um, and also run by people who are very thoughtful, I think, and um, uh, you know really do care about the wider society and about the country, um, not because yeah. of the company, but just because of who they are. Um, and so early in the year, we made a, a public commitment to net zero. Um, we uh, made a commitment to achieve net zero 
um, several years sooner than Scotland or the Scottish government has called for it for the whole of uh, all the organizations in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because we thought, well, we're pretty, pretty big, we're pretty sizable. A water company, by its nature, um, emits a lot of carbon because we cover the, all of Scotland. We have um, individuals who go out in vehicles because they have no other way of getting everywhere in Scotland. Um, we have water treatment plants and wastewater treatment plants. And those are, you know, there's kit and that all uses uh, or emits carbon. So we feel a special um, uh, responsibility to do something about that. So for some time, there's been work about, um, you know, what we've been doing there, we've been measuring, we've been highly innovative, and the innovations, I think, have been um, terrific. Um, so we've worked with some uh, interesting technology originally from Canada, and we now can deliver the heat that comes from wastewater treatment plants to uh, actually heat buildings if they're not too far away. So some of the further education colleges in Scotland are now heated in that way. Um, and, oh. um, you know, that's brilliant. That's yeah. circular yeah, again. Yeah. That's just, you know, you create some heat, let's put it to use. Don't let it yeah. just disappear. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so there's always this notion of, of independence, or I'm sorry, of, of innovation um, mm. in, in doing this. Uh, and, um, you know, that continues in terms of net zero. So we're looking at all the ways that we emit. We look at the fact that we own land because our, our you know, kit, if you will, our, our structures are on land owned by the company. Well, land in itself um, becomes a sink for carbon. Um, mm. Trees do, but land is better because trees get cut down after a hundred years and land is there all the time. So you think about that, you can put w small wind farms on land. So you, you look at all the different ways that we can uh, contribute to uh, a net zero um, mm. uh, outcome and indeed if we can do better we'll do better so that is has been going on all along and those plans continue and um you know we continue to have in-depth updates at our um board meetings uh and so we've not lost sight of that at all um but you know it, another one of my companies which is a FTSE 100 company so not not publicly owned very very much you know private sector organization uh again had a 10-year you know, plan for um, sort of ethical um, business and all its different aspects of business. And that was um, concluded um, in 2019. And during then and right through the um, difficulties now, uh, a new plan has been developed and it's been announced and it's being put into the business, even as they're um, uh, providing groceries and doing another essential um, activity. So, um, oh. you know, it, 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 you, you can't just retreat into your shell. You need mm. to do what you have to do for the moment, but you always have to do it the right way. And that's where some of these um, elements, net zero, for instance, will come into play. Really interesting time because um, we've we've got the Scottish National Investment Bank um, being being established in Scotland, and you were also um, you're involved in uh, setting that up. You were also involved in um, setting up the Green Investment Bank, um, and I was I'm wondering, um, being involved in I guess something which has been set up, the Green Investment Bank and uh, the new Scottish National Investment Bank. Obviously, there is a bit of distance to travel before we see the full potential of um, what that can be. Um, but I, I just wanted to get a, a bit of view of you on what the potential might be and, and the, the hopes we have within Scotland for it. So I, I wouldn't overplay my involvement. Okay. Um, I was yeah. consulted in both cases in the early days and, and actually sat on the committee that chose the very excellent chair for the Scottish National Investment Bank. So yeah, you know, yeah. very close to what it's about. And, um, you know, had a lot of conversations in the early planning days uh, when the Green Investment Bank was a UK national, uh, you know, UK wide initiative and Scotland was dead keen on mm. having it based here. And so the part I was involved in was um, some of that dialogue and how to get the narrative right to see that it might be um, set up here and it was. Um, so, you know, in, in the case of the Green Investment Bank, um, it, it came about because it was a time when um, banks had, for instance, been lending money to um, the big utilities who might be setting up 
wind farms, whatever, these are long 25 year investments mm. and that sort of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. But for regulatory and financial reasons, banks were being told you need to shorten your time frame. you can't do that. So there was then a gap for um, some patient capital, for some um, perhaps capital before a bank could come in. So either mm. early stage capital or uh, maybe growth and expansion, there were sort of gaps as the um, constraints around standard bank funding changed and the Green Investment Bank sort of started off in that uh, in that space so it was filling um, a space again it's just filling a niche um, yeah, and yeah. has done it very well in fact um, Scottish National Investment Bank um, is so new that I couldn't speak to its strategy because um, it's got a goal but you know it needs to and the wonderful new chief executive was very recently announced yeah. but but she needs to build the team and um, you know work out specifically what they're doing but the point of the Scottish National Investment Bank is that it is there to help the growth of Scottish of the Scottish economy. So it's linked to economic needs in Scotland. And again, that gets back to um, understanding your world, which is Scotland uh, in this case, and what its needs are and being able to, um, again, whether it's to provide patient capital, whether it's to provide longer term, uh, you know, lending or, you know, whatever it decides to do, um, it, it is to be supportive of the areas where the um, Scottish government and Scotland as a whole um, have decided they want to grow and strengthen in economic terms. Now, um, will those areas change? Um, you know, yes and no. Um, you know, I'm not sure they would. Very hard to say at this stage. It's too soon in a sense um, to say where all of that will go. But I think that the Scottish National Investment Bank um, has a very interesting job ahead of us and if it has the ability to support businesses, um, let them innovate, let them uh, become bigger and better and more successful in whatever they do and that um, contributes to, uh, to employment, it contributes to uh, reputation in Scotland, it attracts good people to work here and there are lots of things that then really feed into the economy. It means more people are in work, more people have some money to spend, all of that just makes it go around. Really interesting. And you you touched on before uh, about um, change and culture within banks. I can imagine um, so that this whole series on leadership as a leader um, of um, a bank and going through regulatory change. And obviously, there was regulation really affected um, the culture of banks. Um, and has affected the culture of banks over years. What can you say about that change that's happened and how, how one goes about affecting culture change within a large organisation? So that's something that's um, near and dear to my heart as well. So thank you for, um, yeah. for, for, for asking. So if you perhaps look back um, maybe 10 years or so, we had the financial crisis, the um, banks, uh, there were lots of issues. Um, there were some individual issues about how people, you know, in, in banks did their business and made decisions and so forth. There were also systemic issues about requirements for uh, liquidity and, and, you know, the relationship between the regulator and banks and what they were expecting of banks. Um, there's been, you know, a good 10 years or more of um, the regulators and the banks addressing some of those issues so that they're uh, is now um, a regime or a suite of regimes, if you will, where responsibility is very clearly parceled out to um, the senior managers, to the leaders in a, in a bank, where um, banks regularly have to stress test their model, um, uh, sometimes for, you know, a, an event that happens once in a hundred years. So, you know, a pandemic like, yes. like this, yeah. um, they have to show that, you know, how they will cope financially. So um, there's much more rigor around um, the, um, you know, the, the strength of, of our banks, financial uh, institutions. Um, so a, a lot of uh, regulation has come out of all of that. I'm not giving you the regulations, I'm kind of saying what the impact sure. of the regulations are. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, so I ran a bank um, and um, and I know banks and I've sat as a non-executive on the board of another bank and actually I currently, well, I chaired an initiative related to the Chartered Banker Institute, which is um, 
um, UK wide, but you know, is a Scottish institution uh, called the Chartered Banker Professional Standards Board, mm -hmm. where we um, created professional standards for individual bankers. Um, so everybody else has professional standards, um, all sorts of uh, professions and non-professions. These have never been developed for bankers. And now that is uh, sort of mainstreamed within the Chartered Banker Institute. There's mm. something about um, helping bankers, the individuals, understand what's expected of them and how they should behave. So a standard is about the knowledge they need to have in a job. And it's also about the um, ethical and professional behaviors they have to demonstrate. You can't just have knowledge and do something. You need to do it in the right way. Um, currently, and actually the beginning of this year, although again, I was part of setting up, um, the uh, or the founding of the Banking Standards Board. Uh, and this is really interesting organization um, whose job it is to um, look at culture in our banks. And now that it, you know, we're, we've been approached by the investment management community and some insurers, so it's much beyond banks. Mm. Um, but looking at culture um, and helping institutions, helping the boards of these institutions understand what's really going on um, in their organization. So in any organization, you've got a mission, you've got a set of values, everybody knows what they are, you, you know, it's up on the wall uh, or in your screen. Um, and the reporting to the board is, you know, yeah, we're doing this and we're doing that. And it's all looks pretty good. But actually decisions are being made, choices are being made, judgments are being made every day by the people who work in those organizations. And they're light years away from those very senior leaders. So there's a leadership hierarchy, but they're not right there. How does anyone understand what goes through somebody's mind when they're mm. making that decision? And you can't have a regulation or a rule for every single instance. That isn't how life works because you know it just isn't. So uh, what, what we uh, have is a highly um, sophisticated, a very scientific way to help banks assess the culture in their organizations right through the organizations um, and we look at, at major issues um, summarize them talk to bank boards the boards who are you know so the banks have to become members to access this and um, or they can they can just access the, the service but our members are members and we have a lot of interaction with them and they take their findings very seriously and they understand what's the mood in their organization in a way that they can't understand through any other means. So most organizations do a staff survey. You probably do one, um, you know, yeah. big ones do, little ones do, yeah. but you don't have a benchmark um, that is independently developed where you can see that actually you mm -hmm. thought you were pretty good, but there are 10 organizations pretty much like you that are a whole lot better and they've moved on and you haven't. So the work the BSB does is create a benchmark so you can see where you stand and whether you slip back um, or not relative to others, you know there's somewhere to improve. And this is all about culture. It's about what are the pressures that mean that people don't make good decisions? Um, mm. You know, do people feel good about speaking up if there's a problem? Do they feel that, mm. um, management um walk the walk as well as talk the talk and there are lots of lots of instances there are, are people in the organization given the tools and the learning in order to do their their job well or the pressures appropriate and so on so um i think there's a realization that organizational cultures matter enormously to the ultimate success of organizations longer term i mean almost anything can be made to look good in the very short term um, and everything we're talking about here is about longer term. It's about entities being sustainable. So, um, so, so there's regulation, but it can only go so far. And there's something about understanding, the, if you will, the mood and the behaviors um, and the pressures on your people that means that you can go a whole lot further. And as part of that, um, I guess, leadership, is a, is a is a big question and at the moment the, the more than now than ever you know people are speaking about leadership and um what what embodies a good leader what from your point of view talking about characteristics of leadership you know what would you say um throughout your career and working with different leaders and you yourself as a leader what do you think of the kind of key characteristics of someone who displays effective and, and good leadership 
So there, there are probably a million books written on the subject, and I have to tell you, I've never read one of them. So, uh, but so I can really only answer that question, maybe drawing on some of my own um, experience. And I think you know there are lots of different kinds of leaders. That there isn't one you know one ideal form of leader. Um, things that I've learned over time, as I was more junior, being promoted, you know, moving up. Um, one thing that people sometimes try to do, which I think is wrong, is to imitate or to be like or to speak like their boss because their boss is one level up and you know, therefore you should do that. You need to absolutely understand who you are, where you're coming from, and you need to be able to find your voice. It's really important. Um, now, people find their voices in different ways. For me, for various reasons, um, particularly in my banking career, this developed um, by way of asking questions. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not full of bombast. And uh, if I'm around a table, I'll say, you know, I was wondering, what do you think? Do you think we could do this? What would it mean if we said it that way? Um, and that's the way that it seems to me to invite people in. So part of leadership is uh, not just telling. You can tell people to do things and they'll do it up to a time. But actually, um, I think most of us as grown-ups have never really grown up and you know if you tell me if you tell me um, there's a, a way to do something my brain immediately thinks how would I get around that rule but you know I'm you know hopefully responsible enough to think no the rules there for a reason and I shouldn't get around it but um, you know you, you might do something for a while if you're told or you might do the facade of it or, or, or whatever um, but it's really engaging people um, I just think that is so important Another thing about a leader is that um, I do not think any leader that I've ever come across, and this is certainly true of me, has all the answers all the time. In fact, I often really think that I have um, all the answers. Um, and so, you know, two heads are better than one. Ten heads can be better than, than, than two. Uh, it depends on the circumstances. But um, you should really find a way to challenge yourself and your own um, thinking and the best way to do that is with people around you who who just raise things you need to be open you need not to be defensive you need to be able to listen so there's a huge amount about people and about interchange but i also think leadership um style of leadership does need to change for different times so i remember um running Lloyd's TSB Scotland where we were small and we were growing and, and we, we, we did, we, we grew brilliantly. It was, you know, very exciting and it had, you know, every second day there was a problem, but that's the way it is in business. But, you know, it was a really good story. And then we all hit the financial crisis and life had to be very different. And there were a lot of unknowns, a lot of fears, and the style of leadership, um, I, I thought, had to be much more... Um, Directive isn't probably the right word, but something more like that to say, look, here is the situation. It would be nice if we could talk about it, the fact that it wasn't, but it is. Yeah. So we need to find a way around it. Here's a thought. Let's see if we can make this work. So um, more leading um, than, um, you know, from the front, perhaps, than leading from behind is how people sometimes describe it. Uh, but but I, I really believe strongly that you need to um, uh, engage uh, other people and you have better outcomes if, uh, if that's the way it is. And also you hire people and you pay them and why not get the best you can from them? I mean, that's a, that's a you know, commercial concept. You, you, you know, people are your asset. Um, so you give them their wings to some extent, um, but within you know, parameters and within some nurturing. Dame Susan, it has been an absolute pleasure um, speaking to you today. Um, I'm so glad that you've been part of um, the journey with Social Investment Scotland and you're still part of that. Um, thank you. Thank you for taking the time today. It, the whole um, series we're doing is on leadership and um, I think it's a lovely way to, to, to finish this conversation. So thank you. Well, thank you, Kieran. It's been good talking to you.